Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today for our special Christmas message. Let me take this opportunity to wish you all of you and your families a wonderful and blessed Christmas. However you choose to celebrate or not celebrate the day, I hope that you take the time to remember how our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ entered the world. Our reading for today is taken from Luke's Gospel and I shall be reading verses 8 to 20 of chapter 2. So this is Luke Chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marvelled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, here we are again. Another year has passed It only seems like a short time ago that I sat down to prepare my last Christmas message. If you were here last year, you will remember that we looked at the birth of Jesus Christ through the eyes of the Magi. The Magi were powerful, rich and influential men. Today we are going to consider how our Saviour's arrival impacted an altogether different group of men. The men in today's story were at the very opposite end of the social spectrum a group that was often looked down upon and frequently despised, despite the fact that they performed a very important job. Our focus then for this Christmas message will be the shepherds. As you probably know, only two of the four Gospels provide us with any details about Jesus' birth. If you want to know the circumstances surrounding the arrival on earth of the Messiah, you will need to look at Matthew and Luke. Luke's record is about three times as long as Matthew's, and despite the similarities, there are a number of notable differences between the two accounts. Skeptics, of course, point to the differences and claim that they highlight serious contradictions. Because the authors do not agree on all points, we therefore cannot trust the Bible. This is, of course, nonsense. We don't expect people's accounts of historic events to match entirely. In fact, if they did mesh exactly on every single detail, we'd find that suspicious. It would seem to us as if they had colluded. So how can we explain the differences? Firstly, Matthew and Luke were written by two different men, each of whom had a specific target audience in mind. Secondly, and this is connected to the first point, they had slightly differing theological points that they wanted to drive home. Thirdly and finally, we should remember that the writers are tackling their subject matter from slightly differing viewpoints. Matthew doesn't dwell much on the actual birth and its aftermath. In his account, Jesus is born and then Matthew moves quickly on to tell us about the Magi visiting. Luke, by contrast, devotes much more time to what happened prior to the birth and to the events surrounding that wonderful night in Bethlehem. Given this, it is natural that they would include differing details concerning the birth narrative. However, their writing was superintended by the Holy Spirit, who guaranteed that what each wrote was the absolute truth. There are differences, but they can all be harmonised. 
The narratives of Jesus' birth found in Matthew and Luke are not then contradictory, but in fact complementary. It is one of the differences that will be the subject of our study today. We are going to look at the shepherds' involvement. As you can see, the story of the shepherds is wholly absent from Matthew's account. Before we look at today's passage, let me very briefly set the scene. I'm sure that you are very familiar with the birth narrative of the Lord Jesus. You've probably read or heard it preached on many separate occasions, so I'll just provide the very briefest of highlights here. Chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel tells us that during the reign of Caesar Augustus, who was Roman Emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD, a national census was called for. This meant that all people living under Roman rule were expected to return to their hometowns in order to register. This, of course, explains why Joseph and Mary travelled the approximately 80 miles from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea. They were both of the lineage of David. Actually, only the head of the family, Joseph, needed to go, but given Mary's condition, we can understand why he would have taken her along. When they arrive in the very small town of Bethlehem, they find that there is nowhere for them to stay. As a consequence, they are forced to stay in either a stable, a barn, a cave, or most likely the downstairs part of a typical Jewish house. Jewish homes of this period had either one or two floors. In a two-storey house, the upper floor was where the family lived and slept. The lower floor was where the kitchen area was located, and more importantly, where animals were housed. In a single-storey house, the downstairs area would have, been, uh, would have had a section portioned off and given over to the animals. Presumably, in Mary and Joseph's case, the animals were moved at this point to another location, which would allow Mary to make herself comfortable. I know that Christmas cards and images in children's books have the infant Jesus surrounded by sheep, donkeys, camels, dogs, cats, raccoons and other assorted animals, but this is most likely a contemporary fiction. So it's here, in these very modest of circumstances, that the Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings came into this world, born in this very humble location, and laid in a manger or the trough normally used for the animal's food. And it's at this point that we will pick up with Luke's account. Verse number eight. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Luke takes us from the wonderful scene of Mary and Joseph and the infant Jesus in the manger out into the fields or the hills surrounding Bethlehem. We are introduced to the subject of our study today, the shepherds. Today we might have a slightly romanticised view of both this occupation and of the men who did it. So allow me to pop your romantic bubble. Being a shepherd was not an easy or particularly fun occupation. It was a difficult and dangerous job. I found this description outlining the life of a shepherd in Easton's Bible Dictionary. It's very instructive, so let me read it for you. In early morning he led forth the flock from the fold, marching at its head to the spot where they were to be pastured. Here he watched them all day, taking care that none of the sheep strayed, and if any for a time eluded his watch and wandered away from the rest, seeking diligently till he found and brought it back. In those lands sheep require to be supplied regularly with water, and the shepherd for this purpose has to guide them either to some running stream or to wells dug in the wilderness and furnished with troughs. At night he brought the flock home to the fold, counting them as they passed under the rod at the door to assure himself that none were missing. Nor did his labours always end with the sunset. Often he had to guard the fold through the dark hours from the attack of wild beasts or the wily attempts of the prowling thief. So being a shepherd then was not the romantic and carefree existence you might have imagined. So what about those who felt called or driven to this profession? Surely such a job would attract fine and upstanding young men. Well, the people of Jesus' day did not have a very good opinion of shepherds in general. 
there were a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, because they were called to be away, out in the fields, they could not properly observe the ceremonial laws. These laws, of course, were a very important part of life in Israel, so this led them to being looked down upon and often despised. Also, and even more significant, was the reputation that shepherds had of being untrustworthy and often being thieves. As they moved from place to place, they were prone to take things that belonged to other people. They lived, in a sense, outside of the law and had earned a rather unsavoury reputation. As a result, shepherds were considered to be unreliable and dishonest and were for this reason not permitted to give testimony in a law court. However, we should be wary about generalising. We have no reason for thinking that Luke's shepherds were anything other than devout and godly men. After all, why would God have invited them to participate in the glory of his Son? It is, of course, highly significant that God first sent the gospel, the good news, to the lowly and the despised. Luke, throughout his gospel, has a special interest in the lower elements of society. But it reminds us that God's free gift of salvation is for all classes of people. It's not limited to the rich and the powerful. So the shepherds then were out in the fields watching their flocks at night. In order to protect the flock from thieves or from wild animals, one or more of the shepherds would need to stand guard whilst the others would be resting. Every few hours they would rotate. Many also wonder if we can determine when in the year these events took place. You may have heard people claim that the flocks were not taken out during the winter months. So is there any truth to this claim? Well, generally speaking, flocks were kept outside in the fields from the months of April to November. However, if the weather was mild, and Judea frequently enjoyed mild winters, the flocks did stay out during the winter months. Therefore, we cannot say with absolute certainty when exactly these events took place. It's possible, therefore, that it was indeed December. Well, let us read on. Verse number 9. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. As the shepherds are sitting around, a single angel suddenly appeared. Perhaps at this point the shepherds were sitting around a campfire, or maybe they were just resting in the darkness. Today, living as most of us do in a city illuminated by streetlights, we often forget just how dark the countryside can be. So imagine how shocking and scary it would have been to have the darkness of that winter night suddenly pierced by a great radiating light. The original Greek, when literally translated, tells us that they were frightened with massive fear. What they were witnessing was a manifestation of God's amazing glory. So no wonder these men were greatly afraid. Let's see what message the angel has to deliver to them. Verses 10 to 12. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. The angel first assures them that there is no need to be afraid. He has in fact come to bring them good tidings, literally good news. It is, of course, the greatest news ever to be proclaimed. No messenger was ever sent with a greater message than this. Think for a moment, if you will. What is the greatest concern for human beings? Surely it is that we have an indeterminate amount of time here on earth before we die. Certainly we might worry about money, poor health or other circumstances, but these things pale in importance when compared to the reality of our mortality. So to be told that a saviour has come, that you no longer have to face the fear of death, what news could bring you greater joy? The all people mentioned here refers specifically to the Jewish people. But as we know, the Jewish Messiah came for all those elected by God for salvation. The shepherds are told that whilst they were watching their flocks, a wonderful event had taken place. 
In Bethlehem the long-awaited and greatly desired Messiah had been born. The assumption seems to be that the shepherds will go and seek out this baby for themselves. In order to do this, they will need some indicators to help them identify Jesus. After all, there may have been several young infants in Bethlehem at that time. The signs that indicate that they have located this very special child are twofold. Firstly, that he will be wrapped in swaddling cloth. This was neither strange or unusual, as this practice was done for all newborns. Secondly, that he would be lying in a manger. This was much more unusual. The feeding place of animals was not commonly where newborn infants were laid, and this is especially true for a baby of this importance. A royal palace is where one would normally expect to find a king. Let's read on and find out what happens next. Verses 13 and 14 And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Suddenly the single angel is joined by a multitude of the heavenly host. The Greek word used here for multitude is plethios, meaning a large number or a crowd. I like the way John Gill describes them in his commentary. He refers to them as the army or the militia of heaven. Luke is providing us here with a rare glimpse of God's angelic entourage, sent to praise and proclaim his glory. I say rare, and this is certainly true. Only once before, according to biblical revelation, had a human being heard or seen this kind of angelic praise. Let me take you back to the calling of the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. On that occasion, the angels are praising God the Father as he sits in majestic glory on his throne. Now the angels are again praising God and celebrating the arrival on earth of the second person of the Trinity. Let's consider what it was that this angelic host said, proclaimed or laid forth. The primary effect of Jesus coming up on hum humankind is peace. The biblical concept of peace is rooted in the Hebrew word shalom. Now today we might think of the word shalom and think that it is either the equivalent of saying hello or goodbye in Hebrew or something along the lines of peace be with you. There is, however, much more to the word shalom. It actually conveys the idea or the notion of being filled with a complete and perfect peace and well-being. It's also a way of saying May health, prosperity and peace of mind and spirit be upon you. So you see, it goes way beyond being just a simple wish for peace and happiness. Shalom suggests a state of fullness and perfection. And this is precisely what those who have, re who have rebelled against God, all people, need the most. The second effect of the Messiah is goodwill toward men. The Lord Jesus brings joy, peace and completeness to those it is God's good pleasure to draw to his Son. Those who enjoy God's favour, his grace, will receive this wonderful benefit. So we should not misunderstand what is being said here by the angels. They are not declaring God's benevolence to all humanity. Rather, they are celebrating his mercy to those who follow his will by accepting his Son. Well, how will the shepherds respond to this wonderful news? Let's find out. Verses 15 to 16. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. The angels, having spoken of God's glory, return up to the heavenly realm. We assume that they took that amazing, brilliant light with them. The shepherds are returned to the quiet darkness of that Judean hillside. Things are as they were before. 
But in reality, everything has changed. They will be unable to go back to the lives and the world view that they had before. Sometimes we speak of momentous historic events as being world-changing. The 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, the 9-11 attacks on America, the Covid pandemic and the October 7th attacks on Israel. These are just a few examples and I'm sure you can probably think of many others. These events changed people's way of thinking. They also to varying degrees altered the course of world history. But these events, of course, fade into insignificance when compared with the greatest event in all of human history. That was the moment when the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh and was born in Bethlehem. This was the pivotal moment in all of human history, an event that forever changed history for all people for all time. So how will the shepherds respond to the angel's message? How do you suppose many, if not most people, would react to this announcement? Most, I think, would defer. Oh, it's late. I'm tired. It's too much trouble to go now. Let's do it in the morning. Isn't that how most people would respond? But not these shepherds. Luke is at great pains to point out their haste, the urgency they expressed in wanting to go and find the Messiah. They understood that this message had come directly from the Lord. Therefore, they should not delay in seeking out this child. They find Mary and Joseph and the infant Jesus lying in a manger, exactly as the angels had told them. We are left to speculate on how the conversation between the shepherds and Mary and Joseph went. But we should remember that a number of other supernatural events had preceded our Saviour's birth. So to learn that angels had sent them would probably not greatly shock or surprise Mary or Joseph. Well, let's read on and see what the shepherds do next. Verses 17 and 18. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marvelled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. After they had seen the baby Jesus, what did these men do? Well, Luke tells us that they went back to the flocks and carried on as if nothing had happened. No, of course, this is not what they did. We are told that they went around telling everyone they met what had happened. Simply put, these shepherds were the first evangelists. Isn't that an amazing thought? That God in his ultimate wisdom would choose these humble, lowly, often despised class of men to be the first to share the good news. Often Christians will try to excuse themselves from not sharing the gospel by saying that they are ill-equipped or not properly trained. The gospel, such people claim, should be spread by trained professionals like pastors, Bible teachers and missionaries, people who know what they are doing. In effect, though, it's just an excuse, a convenient way of avoiding what we are actually commanded to do. Let me read you Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The shepherds were not trained evangelists. We know nothing about their backgrounds, but given their occupation, we must imagine that they were not highly trained academics. And yet, off they went. What was it they said? Well, they simply reported what they had experienced. They didn't, I'm sure, provide a deep theological lecture to their hearers. Rather, they simply and plainly spoke of what had happened to them. They spoke about their encounter with first an angel and then with the Messiah and how it had changed them. And that's all that is required even today. How was the shepherd's news received? Well, Luke tells us that all who heard marvelled at the news. This is the Greek word thuamatso. It means to wonder or to marvel. All who heard wondered or were amazed. Naturally, they didn't really understand it at this time, but they recognised that something significant and important had happened. Let's turn now to Mary. Her reaction, as we will see, was a little different to the shepherds. Verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. When we compare Mary's reaction with the shepherds, we see a very interesting contrast. 
The shepherds went out, boldly proclaiming to all they met the good news. Mary, by comparison, calmly took it all in and meditated over it in her heart. She sought to understand the deeper meaning or significance of it all. She truly was a remarkable young woman. As an interesting aside, have you ever wondered why Luke focuses so much attention on Mary and on her experiences? How, for example, would he know that Mary pondered these these things in her heart? Well, he either received this knowledge through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or else Mary was his source. He knew all these things concerning Mary because he spoke to her directly about them. Let's conclude our study by looking at verse number 20. Verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. What a night! A night that these humble, lowly men would never forget. Visited first by one angel, then being witness to an army of angels, then seeking and finding the infant Messiah. But it's time now to get back out into the fields. There's work to be done. The sheep need their attention. But these men do not go quietly. As they return, they are glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard. Again, what lessons we can learn from these simple men. As we go through our lives, we too should be glorifying and praising God. What does this look like in practical terms? Well, it means that we should be seen by others as being positive and joyful people. We have the good news of the gospel in our hearts. So we shouldn't be walking around moaning or looking glum. We are living witnesses to the goodness of God. Also, we should be honest and hard-working, as this brings glory to our Creator. Additionally, we should be actively seeking opportunities to draw people's attention to our awesome God. Whenever the situation arises, we can, and should, openly praise Him for all that He has done and continues to do. In doing so, we bring glory and honour to his name. And so, for another year, the Christmas story comes to a close. What a wonderful story it is. Such a shame to only read and be moved by it once a year. Luke's simple and yet profound account is one of the most magnificent that we find in all of Scripture. And such excellence, of course, is befitting of the occasion. The arrival on earth of God himself the birth of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May he be glorified this day and for evermore. Things to think about. I have just one comment to make from today's passage. It is learning from the shepherds. So what can we learn from the shepherds? There are, I think, four important lessons that we can learn from the example of the shepherds. I have, for convenience sake, labelled each of them with the letter R. Receiving, rushing, replaying and rejoicing. Let's consider each in turn. Receiving. When the angel appeared suddenly, the shepherds were rightfully terrified. Perhaps they would have liked to have fled and hid in a cave somewhere. Maybe they were just transfixed to the spot. Whatever the case, they listened and were able to receive the news that the angel imparted. It's vitally important that in whatever situation we find ourselves, that we are able to put the things of this world to one side, so that we can receive what God has for us. How easy it is for us to get distracted by the things around us. God wants to impart his goodness to us through his word, through preaching, teaching or through those around us. So are we like the shepherds, ready and able to receive God's message. Rushing. How did the shepherds respond to the angel's news? Well, we are told they made great haste. They rushed to where they were supposed to be. They rushed, in fact, to be by Christ's side. What an important insight this is for us. How do we respond to calls for our time or attention? When the church needs our help, do we make great haste? Do we rush as quickly as we can? Or are we slow to react? Do we secretly hope that if we delay, someone else might do what's needed before us? 
Let us then be defined as people who are always rushing to be by Christ's side. Replaying Once the shepherds had seen the Lord Jesus, what did they do? Well, as we saw, they went around telling everyone their experiences. They did not care what people thought of them or whether people laughed at them behind their backs. All they desired was to share or replay the good news. We should, of course, learn from their example. As Christ's followers, we should be telling all that we meet about the good news. We do not need to concern ourselves with how professional or polished we are in our delivery. The straight, simple truth is sufficient. Our job is just to say it, and then allow God to do the rest. Rejoicing Finally, we saw how the good news impacted these men. They went back out into the fields, back to work, praising and rejoicing God. They joyfully lifted him up in their praise and worship. They did not allow their mundane daily duties to distract them from their worship. They did not permit the burdens of daily chores to mute their joy. So let us learn from their example. No matter how our lives go, let us delight in praising God and rejoicing in all that he has done. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. 
and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men.